So thank you all very much for joining me today. It is, I'm very excited to speak with you today about scrupulosity and OCD. I have a passion for both the treatment and, and advocacy for OCD. So I'm very excited to be able to speak to such a group of professionals as well who really interface directly with the folks that are experiencing this condition. So for the next 40 or 50 minutes or so, I'm gonna take you through this presentation and then we'll all come back together for the discussion at the end. So in terms of the things that I am going to cover for you today, first, I'm just going to get started with an overview of obsessive compulsive disorder more broadly, kind of what are the features of this diagnosis and what are some common misconceptions that people hold because OCD is actually a disorder that is commonly misconstrued in the media. Um, then we're going to dive into understanding scrupulosity specifically and how it relates to obsessive compulsive disorder. From there, we will transition into what the treatment looks like for scrupulosity. I'll give you an overview of exposure and response prevention and an overview of the types of exposures that we would do with people in this treatment. Um, I'll give a brief overview about why we do this treatment, so why it's effective, the evidence base that we have for it. And then I'll speak specifically to the role that you yourselves find yourself in, kind of the interactions, you know, I've talked with priests before giving this presentation about the kinds of interactions they find themselves in when interacting with a scrupulous individual and what you can do specifically in those moments. And then, of course, we'll come to the discussion period at the end. So just something to keep in mind. Good people from all walks of life find themselves possessed by a thought or a desire to, that does not seem to want to go away. And intrusive thoughts are true of everyone. We all get them. We just kind of tend not to notice them. But for somebody with OCD, that experience of the intrusive thought is very different. So in terms of when we are making this diagnosis, what we require is the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both. What an obsession is, is a recurrent, intrusive, persistent thought that is experienced as unwanted and causes the person significant anxiety or distress. And I'll give some examples of what those would be in a moment. And essentially that the person attempts to ignore or suppress these intrusive thoughts to neutralize them with some type of other thought or an action, which we call compulsions. And so then compulsions are repetitive behaviors or mental acts, right? So it can be something that is observably visible, or it could just be something that the person does in their own mind that they feel driven to perform in response to one of these obsessions or according to rules that must be applied rigidly. What the compulsion serves, serves to do is prevent or reduce distress, prevent some dreaded outcome, but these compulsions are not really connected in a realistic way to the intrusive thought or they're clearly excessive. And what we understand from the practitioner's point of view is though the DSM, the um, diagnostic manual for diagnosing OCD, is that though the criteria say the presence of obsessions, compulsions, or both, that there's always both, right? That obsession, intrusive thoughts occur and the person does something in response to the intrusive thought. When this becomes clinical is when it interferes with the person's life. So when it's causing them significant distress throughout their day, or it's causing impairment in social or work-related or other important areas of functioning. So for example, maybe somebody with OCD, they're living their life. However, the situations that they are in, they're experiencing high, constant, consistent distress or they're not able to go to work, they're not able to care for their children, they're not able to complete household tasks. We'll see increased conflict between family members as a result of the OCD symptoms. Or in the case of scrupulosity, um, it could be that they are actually unable to attend religious services because attending the religious service brings on the intrusive thoughts. So intrusive thoughts in OCD are as varied as is the imagination. Whatever somebody values can be taken over by an intrusive thought. And so these are just some of the examples that of what people will experience across common themes. Contamination is the one that you see most frequently in the media, right? So fear of coming into contact with germs or disease. We also see this, you know, a fear of people coming into contact with radiation or household chemicals. What we discuss less frequently in media and which are pervasive in OCD are the taboo thoughts. So unwanted sexual thoughts, right? So kind of intrusive thoughts about insects 
incest or pedophilia or kind of acting on a sexual impulse. Uh, other taboo thoughts include fear of causing harm to someone. So kind of imagine yourself standing by a subway and you get the intrusive thought of either throwing yourself onto the tracks or pushing somebody onto the tracks. And it's upsetting to you. You don't want to hurt anyone, but the fear just kind of popped into your mind. What if I could do this? So like you said, you can kind of see the gambit of the intrusive thoughts that take shape in OCD. One point that I really want to clarify here is, again, emphasizing that these thoughts are intrusive and unwanted and abhorrent to the individual, right? So in OCD, the thoughts that they're having are not aligned with their values or how they understand themselves, and they want to get away from these thoughts and get away from the accompanying distress. So an example that I have here is somebody saying, I love my children and I would never, ever hurt them, but I keep having sexual thoughts about them. No matter how hard I try to push the thoughts away, they keep coming. I have to keep myself away from my kids to keep them safe from me and my thoughts. You can clearly see in this little vignette how disturbing this is to the person, how they want to protect their kids, and they're afraid of themselves, afraid of the thoughts that they're having. Versus egosyntonic means that these thoughts are wanted and desired and they are aligned with how the person understands themselves, right? The distress that comes from the thoughts that they have is not from the thoughts themselves, but because of the consequences that come from pursuing their thoughts or their desires. So for example, I'm attracted to children, but I can't act on it because I would go to jail. I wish I could. The distress here is with the consequence of going to jail, not with the experience of the, of the thoughts related to attraction to children. The compulsions that we see in OCD, so again, things that people do to try to prevent a bad outcome or to try to get rid of distress or to try to neutralize their thoughts, again, as creative as the mind is creative, but we see some general themes. So what you might have seen most frequently in media is kind of excessive hand washing or excessive bathing, cleaning items. Um, or repetitive checking. So, you know, you'll hear stories about people checking the stove or checking to see if their front door is locked. Um, but often we also, again, see mental compulsions. So if I'm reviewing in my mind, you know, I'm afraid that I've offended you all just in the course of this, of this presentation so far. Let me go back in my mind and review and make sure that I didn't say anything offensive and kind of that mental analysis. Um, counting, trying to replace bad thoughts with a good thought. So if I have an intrusive thought about harming someone, I instead call to mind an image of myself hugging that person instead. So the first video that I'm going to share for you here is just kind of, it's animated, but it is the experience of OCD from somebody that has OCD. I don't understand what's happening to me. There's something seriously wrong. I'm having unimaginable thoughts about violence and harming other people. I can't tell anyone. God, what would they say or think? My partner will think I'm a monster. Some of the thoughts are sexual. I'm scared of knives in the house and I see myself picking one up. I have to keep a mental checklist of what I've done throughout the whole day. I'm checking the oven all the time to make sure it's off. I'm checking emails to make sure I haven't said something I shouldn't. I see plastic bags and I think I could kill someone with them. I even worry about driving and causing accidents in the road. I've been looking online to see if I really am a bad person. Where did these thoughts come from? The fact I'm having them means I am bad. I feel like locking myself in a room so I can't hurt anyone. So my family isn't at risk. I wish I could tie myself up so I'm not a danger to anyone. I need help. I don't think I can cope much longer. So I think you can see from what I have described so far and from just that video that OCD is not the quirky representation that you might have seen on media, right? So kind of celebrities will joke, it's like, oh, look at my, my OCD because of my organized closet, but that's really not the experience. 
the experience is this cycle that you see before you of these intrusive, unwanted thoughts, the things that people feel driven to do to try to force these thoughts out of their mind and these underlying beliefs that they hold about themselves, right? I'm a bad person for having thoughts like this. I should be able to control the thoughts that go through my mind. If I think it, it's more likely to happen and I'm a monster. And it really is a devastating disorder. Now, that was the broad overview of OCD generally, but let's dive a little bit more specifically into scrupulosity. And what scrupulosity is, is when the intrusive thoughts in OCD take content of religious themes, or also kind of we're expanding that to include moral themes as well. And so first again here, just a brief little video of a psychiatrist describing scrupulosity and we'll go into more detail. Uh, it, OCD may involve religious thoughts. Um, uh, patients have been described that have to pray a certain number of times or say a prayer in a very specific way. That's their compulsive behavior. Or may have to touch the cross or the beads or whatever it is a certain number of times or in a certain way for fear that if they don't, something terrible will happen that God uh, will, will bring upon them. So they have this religious kind of obsessive thoughts. God will come down on me unless I pray in a certain way, pray a certain number of times, uh, do certain specific uh, prayer things, say certain words over and over and over again. And again, that can be very unusual and very curious so that people who hear about that say, wow, that's kind of weird. And yet the people that have these disorders don't, will often tell you, I know it's weird, Doc. I know it's weird. I just can't stop doing it. I try to stop, but every time I stop praying in a certain way, my anxiety goes so high I can't function. So how do they stop it? They go back and they pray. Or they wash their hands, or they check their locks, or they check their stoves, or bumps, or couch, or whatever they're going to do. So, in scrupulosity, the types of intrusive thoughts that we will see people experience, kind of whether you have confessed all known sins or not, and this is probably what you see most frequently in the confessional, that somebody is doubting whether or not they have fully confessed the sins that they have committed whether or not they may have sold their soul to the devil, uh, whether they perfectly understand every detail of the doctrine and teachings of their faith community. They might experience sacrilegious or blasphemous intrusions, and these would link more specifically to the taboo thoughts that I described earlier. So, you know, they might have a thought like, God is really the evil one. They might have a thought like, I want to worship the devil, even again, though they don't. They might have intrusive sexual images about, you know, religious figures in compromising positions, either with themselves or with each other. Um, they'll experience intrusive thoughts as to whether they are perfectly following the regulations of their faith community, uh, whether their prayers were sincere enough, whether they were giving enough of their caring during their prayer time. Um, if they have failed to adequately earn God's forgiveness, or again, very commonly that they've committed an unpardonable sin and you know, will be subsequently rejected. And then in terms of the types of things that we see to attempt to neutralize those intrusive thoughts are the repeated trips to confession. You may also see avoidance of the Holy Eucharist, right? In the sense that if I'm in a state of sin, I'm not supposed to be receiving the Holy Eucharist. You can see repetitive praying or religious mantras and often ending when it either feels perfect or feels right and of not a really definable definition, but just a feeling that the person has that they're ready to stop praying. Um, you'll very often see reassurance seeking in conversation, conversations in which the person is looking for absolute certainty, right, kind of an absolving of the doubt that they're experiencing excessive engagement in religious rituals, much more than others in the same faith community. And this can be a way that we identify if scrupulosity is in play as well, is kind of what is this person doing in comparison to what most people do? Um, an inability, inability to stop engaging in uh, charitable deeds when it's appropriate to do so. 
and also Google, well, it does come with many good benefits. It does also come with some uh, challenges as well is that we'll see excessive research or mental rumination in terms of answering spiritual questions. I also want to take a moment here to delineate scrupulosity and OCD from just typical religious practice or the tender conscience. Religious practice, we acknowledge that while we're I kind of moving towards the ideal of perfect adherence, we don't see that as being necessary to avoid severe punishment from God or to avoid, you know, kind of being ravaged in the hellfires. Rather, it's what, something that we are working towards. And our religious involvement is marked by joy, love, freedom, a sense of belonging in the community, and it's motivated by love for God. The tender conscience, again, you'll kind of maybe see anxious tendencies in these individuals, but they can reasonably differentiate what is sinful from what is acceptable behavior. And their fears are often assuaged, assuaged by an advice, when advised by a confessor, right? Kind of they're able to be able to be comforted. Scrupulosity, on the other hand, is driven by fear excessive and rigid concerns regarding particular aspects of religiosity, right? Maybe even actually overlooking parts that are bigger, but laser focusing on something specific. They cannot tolerate religious uncertainty and intolerance of uncertainty is true of OCD across the board. And scrupulosity is marked with fear, anxiety, guilt, and shame, right? It's not motivated by that love for, love for God, it's motivated by the fear and trying to avoid punishment. So just to check in with where we are so far in our agenda, I've gone over OCD, I've gone over understanding scrupulosity. Now I would like to take you into what treatment looks like. So that's where we will progress next. And then we'll look at the, the effectiveness and then bringing the role of the priest specifically. So as mentioned, the treatment for scrupulosity is exposure and response prevention. And this is the most effective type of psychological treatment that we have for obsessive compulsive disorder. I take great pride in the fact that of all of the psychological disorders, ERP has the strongest evidence base. And it's, it's very simple just to kind of identify what we are asking people to do, which is exposure, confronting their thoughts, confronting the images, the objects, and the situations that make them anxious. And then the response prevention is resisting any of the compulsive urges that aim to artily, artificially reduce anxiety, right? So putting yourself in the situation and not doing anything to try to make it feel less dangerous or feel less anxious. An example for you here outside of the religious sphere is a fear of heights, right? So this is somebody at the Chicago Tower, the Chicago Willis Tower, overlooking down into the city below. And the exposure is putting herself in that situation, looking from that high up height. And the response prevention, don't look away, don't leave, don't reassure yourself that you won't fall down, just be in the moment. Come into full contact with what you can see around you. Feel what you're feeling, whether it's an emotion, whether it's a physical sensation, and stay in this situation until you have learned something, right? It could be that you learn that fear comes down on its own over time as you stay, kind of like when you get into a cold pool and your body adapts to the temperature, the same thing is true for emotions. It could be that you learn that what you're afraid of happening isn't actually likely. So maybe in this case, a fear that the glass is going to crack beneath her and she's going to fall. Or it could be that she learns just that she can cope with the distress that she's experiencing. The exposures that we do are based in learning. Now, when it comes to exposures targeting religious obsessions specifically, these are some of the things that we might do with someone. And looking at these, they might seem a bit weird, right? For example, writing the word devil repeatedly on a sheet of paper or looking at pictures of demons or you know, you might think, who would do that? Why would somebody put themselves in a situation like this? But exposures are actually things that just typical people do every single day. They just seem a little bit weird because we're doing them on purpose. Like, for example, one of my favorite television shows is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And you can't go a single episode without seeing a representation of a demon. Or even if I was going to read the Bible, I would need to come into contact with that word devil, right? or going to a movie theater and the trailer pops up and it's one of those new scary movies about exorcism or about possession. 
These are typical situations that people find themselves in all the time that we just approach on purpose so that the person can get the experience again of learning that they can tolerate the distress of coming into contact with these things, that what they fear is going to happen isn't actually likely, right? So by writing out, by writing the word devil on a sheet of paper or using the word devil in a sentence, that's not actually an invitation to become possessed. Um, and again, just kind of the, what, what have I said so far? The learning to cope, feared outcome is going to happen. All right, and as you stay in the situation, that anxiety does come down over time. Eventually, as you're looking at that picture, it just gets kind of boring. In terms of what we would ask people to resist in the treatment for scrupulosity, reducing visits to confession, right? So if somebody is repeatedly seeking confession, we would ask them to reduce this. Maybe they can reduce it, you know, kind of going to the typical uh, large religious feasts schedule of confession. Maybe we have to be a little bit more gradual with that. Maybe it's starting with once a week down to once every other week, down to once a month until they can get to a more normative schedule. And also we would ask them to just focus on speaking with a single confessor, right? Not going to different confessors to try to seek reassurance for the doubt that they're experiencing. We would also ask them to eliminate compulsive prayer. And this is very different from asking them to eliminate prayer. We want these people to be practicing their faith. We want them to be engaging in faith-based prayer. What we want to do is eliminate the prayer that is a compulsion. Right? One that is based in fear, kind of, Lord, please take these thoughts from my head. Lord, please make sure that this bad thing doesn't happen. I'm sorry if I've offended you today, Lord. Those are all driven out of fear. But rather, we ask people to continue with the prayer that is faith-based, right? Expressing their love for the Lord and maybe even asking for the courage to engage in treatment. We would ask them to eliminate that mental analysis to determine if they've sinned, right? I mean, absolutely an examination of con conscience can be a valuable activity for a lot of people, but with the scrupulous, it goes above and beyond and becomes harmful. So we would ask them to resist trying to catalog all of their thoughts and all of their experiences for the day to determine if they have sinned. And then also to reduce their avoidance of things that trigger their intrusive thoughts. So if they're avoiding going to church, we would ask that they go to church. If they are avoiding, you know, kind of listening to a particular podcast or going to the grocery store, we want these people to be able to live their lives, right? Live their lives with flexibility, do things based on their values rather than avoid things based out of fear. So reducing avoidance is often a major target for the exposures that we design. This I just kind of thought was funny. I thought I'd throw it in for you. This lady gave me her food order. I repeated it back and told her that comes to $6.66, which actually is just, again, a point to point to illustrate about our exposures is that again these are things that life gives us life gives us the number 666 all the time and we need to be able to come into contact with that I have one young woman that I worked with many uh, well not many years ago I just guess just a couple years ago and she was very early on in treatment she was in the residential facility where I was working and she could not speak, she could not even look at the number six, even just by itself, because of how strongly it was linked to this fear that she was going to become possessed. And so one day we were doing community exposures out at the mall. And as she was walking, it, walking up and down the halls of the mall, just focusing on walking. Um, and there was a big sign, like a massive billboard sign hanging from the roof. And I don't remember what it was exactly, like it might have been a realtor or something, but in the phone number was just the number six. And every time she walked past it, she shuddered and she looked away. And eventually, as she was walking the halls of, mall, of the mall, she was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, I need to be able to see this number. You know, even thinking of other things in the mall, like a sale that has the number six in it. These are things that people need to be able to come into contact with. Again, the aim of our treatment is to learn that anxiety and doubt are safe and tolerable. Just a quick, a quick snippet of what somebody's experience was like with treatment. ERP is absolutely one of the hardest treatments to go through. And yet it's not as hard as living with OCD and so much growth and meaning comes from engaging in the treatment. And I do tell all my patients that despite not believing me at the beginning of treatment, they will laugh as we go. 
So why would we recommend the use of exposure and response prevention for scrupulosity? ERP is the first line treatment for OCD recommended by both the Canadian and the American Psychological Associations, equal to or better than medications. In medications, these are only effective in about 40 to 70% of cases and response, positive response to a medication is about a quarter to a 35% reduction in symptoms. But with exposure and response prevention, we get, we get greater than 35% reduction in symptoms in 90% of cases. However, of individuals with OCD, less than half actually get ERP. There's a big problem in our society in that partially because of the way it's portrayed in the media, people don't actually recognize OCD when it's in front of them. And so these people don't know what they have. They don't know the treatment to pursue, you know, and they don't know that they need this specific type of treatment. So that's again why I'm excited to be speaking with each of you today is because how much you interface with the lay public and you know, both you and they may not know that what's in front of them or kind of what they're experiencing in OCD, but with this added knowledge, I'm hoping that maybe you might be able to spot it a little bit more effectively. Um, additionally, ERP benefits are maintained at one to five years follow-up. So we've done a lot of research on ERP and, you know, folks that are involved in treatment studies, they follow up with them multiple years later and they're still maintaining the gains that they received in treatment. And then additionally, it targets more than just the OCD related symptoms, but we see significant improvements in quality of life and improvement in conditions that happen at the same time as OCD. So that's what comorbid meaning at the same time. So depression, generalized anxiety, for example. So I want to take a moment here to just let you know what my goal and what the goal of other therapists are. And if you meet a therapist or if somebody that you know is interacting with a therapist that is not aligned with these goals, I would ask that you tell them to run very quickly and very far away because I know that there are some ineffective therapists out there. I can't deny that that, that exists within my profession. But the goal of the therapist that works with OCD is to respect and work within the person's religious tradition. Our goal is not to make them faithless. Our goal is to allow them to practice their faith with freedom and love. Our goal is to help the client grow in healthy faith, freedom to practice their religion rather, from love rather than from fear. We also want to help distinguish what is a healthy spiritual practice and what is a scrupulous practice. We want to help them take a step back from their thoughts as being facts and instead to interact with their thoughts as kind of the electrical impulses that they are, right? Their ideas, their words, their syllables, but take a step back and notice these thoughts rather than fusing with them as though they are truths. We also want to help the person change the beliefs that they hold, you know, those beliefs that I described earlier on in that cycle, the beliefs that they are bad, the belief that God seeks to punish them, the belief that uncertainty is intolerable. And, you know, for the record, we all tolerate in uncertainty all the time. You know, kind of think about where you're sitting right now and think about somebody, you know, in your life that you love. Are they alive right now? How do you know? You're taking it on faith. We tolerate uncertainty all the time. It just feels for the person with OCD, it feels unbear unbearable in this particular domain. And we are helping them to teach, helping to teach them that they can tolerate uncertainty in this area too. And then finally, our goal is to help them regain their functioning and engage with their values. Okay, so now we come to you specifically. What are you to do when faced with a scrupulous person? From my understanding, these are the types of situations that you find yourselves in most frequently. Hearing repeated confessions, getting caught in frustrating conversations, trying to reason with somebody that's experiencing scrupulosity. And you may or may not have noticed this last one, but observing parishioners getting in and out and in and out and in and out of the line for Holy Communion, right? As they battle with, am I in a state of sin or can I receive God's grace? So taking a step back just for a moment, I wanna go over what accommodation is in OCD. 
And accommodation is something that we target in treatment specifically with family members, which is that the person living with the individual with OCD, when they accommodate the OCD, they are participating in or encouraging compulsive behaviors. They're for facilitating the person's compulsions or they're facilitating the avoidance, you know, avoidance of things in their life. And with scrupulosity or just kind of OCD more broadly, some examples that we might see are providing reassurance that the person's concerns have no basis. You know, so kind of telling them repeatedly, it's like, no, God loves you. He's not going to punish you. Like, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine, right? Engaging in attempts to reason with the person's fears and anxieties, maybe going over specific Bible passages as proof for the person's concerns having no basis, or encouraging them to engage in compulsive prayer, right? So encouraging them, if you feel like God doesn't love you, pray more, pray more fervently, which actually just perpetuates that distress because, again, it's that fear-based prayer rather than allowing themselves to feel afraid and feel uncertain and save prayer for love and faith. The problem with accommodating is well documented. It interferes with the person's recovery. It limits the opportunity to learn that feared outcomes don't occur, right? So in accommodation, if we encourage somebody to avoid that which makes them fearful, they never get the opportunity to learn that what they're afraid of isn't actually likely. Again, by using the word devil in a sentence, I'm not actually likely to become possessed. Um, it limits their opportunity to learn to cope with distress. So if somebody comes in and protects me from feeling afraid or feeling doubtful, that undermines my sense of self-efficacy that I can cope with that. Um, it also significantly reduces the motivation to change. And the way that I actually really like to describe this is in my house, if I know that my husband is going to kill every spider, then I don't have to overcome my fear of spiders. I know that he's going to take care of it for me. Whereas if I knew that he wasn't going to, that would be a motivator for me to move forward with overcoming this fear that I hold. And then finally, accommodation interferes with recovery in the sense that it prevents the individual from experiencing that anxiety reduction over time. All emotions follow a natural course. They peak and then they subside if we do nothing about it. But if they peak and we do something to get rid of it or we do something to help the help the individual get away from their intrusive thoughts or get away from their distress, we don't actually get that natural course. It gets interrupted. So the next time we're in that situation, our anxiety is going to peak just as high or even higher. And then additionally, accommodation is linked to more dysfunction and stress. So we see increased conflict and stress. We see increased frustration and exhaustion with each interaction. It ends up consuming more and more and more of your time, right? And your time is precious, your time is limited. And so as you get your, find yourselves caught in a cycle of accommodation, more and more of that time is taken away from you. Reassurance, the seeking and provision of reassurance is the, probably the most common form of symptom accommodation. And what reassurance aims to do is to gain certainty where none is actually possible, right? It serves to reduce perceived threat by gaining perspective from a trusted source. It can look like asking a lot of questions. It can look like asking the same question over and over again, right? But are you sure? Like, but what about this? Are you, are you certain? It can look like asking a question in hopes of getting a specific response, right? You're not, you're not asking the question to learn, you're asking to hear what you want to hear. And the problem with giving reassurance is that maybe you've experienced this, it can be a bit of a bottomless pit, bottomless pit because you can never give enough. Right? The more you give, the more OCD wants. And again, kind of, it's like you've got this little OCD cloud following the person around that's eating up more and more of this reassurance as it seeks more and more certainty. Because OCD is always going to be introduce that doubt and that doubt that the person experiences is intolerable. So it needs more and more and more of that comfort and reassurance until it's satisfied. But even then it only lasts for a short time. And again, this is one of probably the most important points Reassurance undermines the treatment work because it provides the client with the message that there is actual danger, right? By attending to this intrusive thought, by giving it meaning, just by even talking about it, it reinforces this idea that this thought is meaningful. This thought needs to be done something about it. And all in all, reassurance can be pretty exhausting at the end of the day. You cannot answer every question. At some point, you just have to have faith. 
what we as treatment providers ask is learning to provide support to someone, not to provide reassurance. So again, reassurance being the act of removing doubt or fear, doing something to try to reduce their distress, reduce artificially, reduce anxiety in the moment, or to attempt to offer certainty when certainty is not available. You know, Father, are you sure that if I do this, I'm, I haven't sold my soul to the devil or the devil's not going to possess me? It's like, I have a probability estimate that the devil is not going to possess you, but I don't actually know, right? I can't predict the future. And reassurance aims to achieve that certainty where it's not actually possible. Whereas rather than providing reassurance, what we encourage our families and our support people to do is to instead focus on providing validation. This is to communicate to the other person that what they are experiencing is understandable, that it has a cause, that what they are experiencing is very scary and very real and nothing more than that right it's non-judgmental we're not we're not criticizing them or condemning them for having these doubts or fears we're acknowledging their point of view we're conveying understanding and empathy without trying to fix things or change things we're just being there for them Specifically in the confessional, I defer to my esteemed colleague, Father Tom Santa, based out of Michigan, who has done much work in scrupulosity, and he speaks specifically to how to navigate the scrupulous conscience in confession. I, I sometimes get frustrated. Um, I get frustrated because when a person is engaged in a full, what we call a full-blown obsessive compulsive disorder ritual, playing out of that ritual, which within the scrupulous tradition and within Catholic tradition would be within the confessional. Mm. There's nothing you can do to it. There's nothing that you can do. And so the thing I tell priests when I give conferences about this is just let it play out. Don't argue with them. Don't try to interrupt them because it's let it play out. And when they catch their breath, and they will catch their breath, all you need to do is say to them, I understand what you're talking about. And if you ever want some help, let me know. Mm -hmm. You might say that a hundred times before they hear it. And when they do hear it, then they can be put onto a path where they can get some help. And mostly the help is lessening the anxiety, learning skills to lessen the anxiety, learning skills to avoid the ritual. Um, and it's, it's, it's a struggle, but it can be done. Uh, when you hear a confession of a scrupulous person, give them the smallest penance that you can think of that can be done easily. Don't go out and tell them, now I want you to go sit in church and think about the fact that God loves you. That would be the worst thing to tell a scrupulous person. How long do I sit in church? Is it an hour, two hours? What happens if I have a thought that distracts me? Do I have to start it over? So you don't give any of those, what we would say, touchy-feely penances. You would give a penance and say, say one imperfect our father with as many distractions and everything else that you want your only penance is to repeat the words as they're written nothing else you know well they can do that yeah. you know all right so in terms of other things that you can say to provide support rather than giving reassurance or accommodation um i've got them up for this up on the screen for you here so kind of again seeking to understand i want to make sure i understand you're feeling anxious and worried because you're afraid you've offended God. Is that right? Or, you know, if they find themselves struggling and wanting to give up, I'm not surprised. Every day is a huge challenge for you to make it through with all of the anxiety you've been experiencing. I know you can do this. I'm here to support you. I can see the hurt that you're experiencing right now. I am sorry that you are in so much pain. When you find yourself getting pulled into one of those repeated conversations, you know, what kind of seeking to clarify and rationalize or try to go through specific minutia, it is okay to put up a boundary. In fact, we encourage this, right, to stop and say, we have been down this road before and we know where it leads, right? It leads to frustration. I cannot engage in something that I know is harmful to you because you do know that it's harmful for the person. It is a compulsion and compulsions are what keep the disorder alive, right? That's what we're talking about is obsessive compulsive disorder. And you know 
from this presentation or maybe from your own experience that participation in compulsions keeps the person sick. And then if maybe somebody is has that knowledge and they're a little bit further along in their recovery, you can just straight up ask them, how can I help you resist this compulsion? Right? That's something that I speak with my clients all about and encourage their families to do as well. For your role, right? So I took you through the role of the therapist, the role of the clergy, again, kind of to encourage them to meet with a single confessor rather than going priest shopping to focus on sticking with one specific person, right? To reduce that reassurance seeking. Your role also to replace the reasoning and the reassurance with validation, right? Acknowledgement of their experience and offering, you know, to put them on the path of recovery and treatment. Providing encouragement to seek treatment to overcome their scruples. And while not something that would come up frequently, but it could be helpful to meet one time with the scrupulous person and their therapist if they're in therapy. And this is for two reasons. One is that scrupulosity can often, the treatment for it can often hit a wall because clients are unwilling to go through with the treatment, right? This idea that this fear that they hold of offending God or getting possessed, that an initial absolution from their faith provider can help them to buy into treatment. And then also both for not only for the benefit of the, uh, of the patient, but also for the benefit of the therapist, because it's not necessarily going to be true that the therapist that they are meeting with is going to share in their religious tradition. And so they will need to know and be able to delineate what is the practice of faith and what is scrupulous, what is OCD. All right, so I've got a few resources for you here. There are a couple books um, that I've included. The Doubting Disease being a phenomenal read, as is Understanding Your Scrupulosity, written by the priest that was just shown in those videos. And then for OCD more broadly, um, my favorite book to recommend is by Dr. Jonathan Grayson, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. I've also got some websites at the bottom here, the link for the International OCD Foundation. And then Father Santa also has two initiatives. One is Managing Scrupulosity, which is a consulting based uh, initiative where he will speak with faith leaders in terms of helping somebody uh, identify, navigate and overcome scrupulosity. And then also his Scrupulous Anonymous letter, which has been in place since you know the early 60s or mid 60s. And essentially there is a newsletter that is put out regularly that individuals with a scrupulous conscience can write in for guidance. And uh, you know, he often provides teachings in these newsletters as well. All right, and that is where I will leave you. This is where we will, well, not leave you, but this is where we will transition into our discussion.